my brother's keeper. The first verse right there, 2540, says in the Bible, the king will reply, reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now today's message is, I don't know, a little more free speaking than normal, but a few days ago I was sitting on the couch with my computer open at the coffee table working on sermons or whatever I was working on. It's It's been a, been a pretty busy month and uh, Grace, my wife, walked in the house and this is a scene that plays out every day in our house. Uh, one of us arrives back from running errands and comes in the back door through the kitchen and usually we walk in and set down grocery bags and begin chatting to the other person about the day or where we've been or what's going on. And this time, uh, Grace came in and made her way through the kitchen and I rose up from my uh, couch office to greet her like I always do. And she looked at me and she started weeping. Well, I didn't know what was going on. As a husband, you get a little weirded out by that. And she started crying and I said, what's wrong? And she said, I cannot stop thinking about these people suffering from this hurricane and this what's going on down there. And, you know, I tried to comfort her the best I know how. Usually I just stand far away and rub the back of her head. No, I'm just kidding. I know some men aren't good at comforting people, but I, I did. I hugged her. I held her. We talked. I, I, I tried to comfort her and and uh, we spent all that day and even up to today we've still been we, we talk about it constantly and um, we started talking about all the people we know down there and who we haven't heard from and who we have heard from and and Grace got a text message back from her niece Marissa because Grace had texted her are you okay and Marissa finally texted back I copied and pasted it this is what she said I love you so much. We're on day 11 without power. You hear nothing but helicopters and military copters. Then most of the roads are literally dirt roads. Places I used to see daily are gone, wiped out. People's belongings are outside of their homes due to the flooding. This is an unreal sight to see. And my heart breaks for these people. This lousy $750 we're getting, I'm donating half back to the animal rescues that really need it. Mom's okay. Cameron and I have set up a generator for her yesterday. Hopefully she'll get her power back on Tuesday or Wednesday. <clears throat> that was the end of that. I started thinking about, well, we both started talking about all the folks that imagine if you don't have a home to go to today and you get there and it's just gone and there's just stacks of lumber and trash and I mean, I, I checked in with the National Weather Service because I was having a conversation with Grace. I was thinking about it, and I had a conversation with her later about the totality of everything, and I, I wanted to go read the data on it and what they said. Now, this is Helene, because Milton hadn't been here yet, and this is what it said on their website. It said, Hurricane Helene made landfall in the Big Bend area of Florida Gulf Coast as a Category 4 storm late in the evening of September 26th. 2024. Helene's largest impacts were across the southern Appalachians where, wide, where, widespread, where widespread and severe unprecedented flooding occurred with hundreds of fatalities, hundreds of fatalities, and billions in property damage. Strong wind gusts damaged property and blew trees and power lines down in a swath from the Gulf Coast to the North Carolina mountains. That's a 900 mile wide storm. That's massive. And some of the information, and, and this was bothering me that, you know, I know some people were talking on TV about not understanding why some of the stuff happened in, in Carolina and all that, because I've always been amazed the past 10 years that they never talk about tornadoes. They always talk about hurricanes, but they never talk about the tornadoes that come with them. Now, this week they started to do that finally. When, it, when Milton came. But the information was not discussed at all up to the point I was researching this and checking with the National Weather Association, uh, their, their, their data. 
Hurricane Helene on the outskirts spawned six tornadoes that combined did 28 linear miles of destruction. Think about how many houses are in one mile here. And then that's 28 miles. And some of the gusts on the outskirts of the tornadoes were 95 miles an hour. It was extremely destructive. And, in, you know, I mean, and only someone with no heart. I mean, it would, it's impossible not to feel for these people and their pain, what they're going through. I mean, I think about how I lose my mind if I get locked out of the house. I can't imagine the house being gone, the food being gone, the bank being gone, the grocery store being gone. And who's ever walking down the street, I hope they got something they could help me with. After church last week, Dave Winkleman, who's here somewhere, there he is over there, we, 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 were, we were talking, we were having a conversation about all this stuff. And he, we, we talked about what to do, and he shared with me something that a lot of people are experiencing, I know I was, and that is a strong pull to go there. Just to go, just to do something. Just do something. Go. Do something. We had a good conversation about this. And by good, I mean meaningful and productive and getting out what's on the inside to think about it. And now we got a second uh, hurricane coming. Milton. And that just ravished Florida. I mean, that came and ravished Florida again. Those tragedies are attached to our, to our hearts. And so I went to the leadership here and I proposed giving this week's offerings to the hurricane effort instead of having a separate box for donations. Just the entire staff agreed. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we should do. No doubt about it. Send every penny. Uh, Dave and I talked some more. And by this time, he had made the decision to move forward with this going to the area and getting some plans together. And I know there's been some stuff on Facebook and you still working on that, that, that project? Yeah, to get people to go down there and to get others to join because there's a lot of people that want to go and a lot of people that feel pulled. So today, I've never asked for anything in the pulpit, but I'm asking you to donate today for this if you can. I see all over the news how this is being weaponized for political purposes. And, and, and God knows, I, I have my own political opinions about how it's being handled here, but we're called by the Lord to do what we can for the suffering. We don't make this about politics. I mean, we, we make this about people. We make this about serving God. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So you, I got this statue here. I've had this statue up here once before. It's a statue of, of, of Jesus. This statue, the hands are missing on this statue. This was my mom's. My mom kept so many trinkets, knickknacks, and doodads everywhere. Just it was, it was an assault on the senses. <laughs> if there was a blank spot on the wall, she had to hang something there. If there was a blank spot on a shelf, she had to put something there. I walked by this stuff and never noticed it. And I, I started looking at this one day. And it absolutely arrested my attention. And I said, what happened to the hands on that statue? And she said, I guess I just broke off over the years. I'm, I'm not quite sure. She wanted to know why I was so fixated on this. Why I, was, I, couldn't, I couldn't quit talking and looking at the statue. It says right on the bottom, I am with you always. So I finally told her the story of why I was so fix, fixated on this statue. Because it's, it's a story I heard many years ago, and I think it was, might have been from Adrian Rogers, a pastor, I'm not really sure, because it's been a long time since I heard this story, but it's never left me. And it was a story about a small town in Europe that was decimated in World War II by bombing raids. And when they were sifting through the rubble and digging people out and locating the dead and starting to rebuild, there were a group of people, including some soldiers, working on the church and in front of the church there was a statue of Jesus and they were collecting the parts they could and reassembling the statue and putting it back together so when they had finally got it almost completed and standing they had a problem they couldn't find the hands of the statue and, and they, they, they were asking they really were laboring over this so they asked the guy in charge and I honestly can't remember if it was a commanding officer or if it was a pastor 
They said, we can't find the hands. We've got everything, but we can't find the hands. And he said, it's fine. Leave it. Don't worry about the hands. Leave them off of it. They didn't like this answer. They thought they could at least make some and put them on there. They pressed him on the matter and said, how can you be so nonchalant about the hands? And he interrupts and says, we are the hands. We're the hands. Okay? We are the hands. Do you understand? Light bulb. Right? Went off. Yeah. I get it. We are the hands. We extend Christ's love to the suffering because love is an action. Love is an action. What is love? Love is, love is to choose the, the best interest of another person over your own and act on their behalf. That's what love is. That's the action of love. That's being the hands. And you can imagine when I saw this statue and I remembered that story that I never forgot. And these are broken off. This statue didn't come that way. It's in my office. All the, I look at it and I think about it. My mom was moved. She gave me the statue. Not like she couldn't go without it. I could have stole it. She never would have known. I wouldn't steal a statue of Jesus. <laughs> but... She gave it to me. And so this is where we are now. We are the hands. We are, in fact, our brother's keeper. That, that phrase that we hear all the time, am I my brother's keeper? It's an interesting phrase. There's many lessons to be learned from that entire Bible story. You can, there's many Bible stories that you can, you can take out several meanings from that do not contradict one another. It just never stops feeding. We've all heard it. I'm going to read it. The story of where it comes from in Genesis 4, 1 through 10. Adam made love to his wife Eve. She became pregnant, gave birth to Cain, and she said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offerings, but on Cain, his offering he did not look on with favor. So Cain was angry, and his face was downcast. And the Lord said, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother, Abel, let's go out in the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. So the first recorded murder in history was a church-going person of God right after church. Right after the offering, seriously. One of God's children, first murder in Genesis, murdered right after church. That's a heavy thing to think about. This evil, this evil act took place a few minutes right after that offering. And then Cain's sarcasm. Am I my brother's keeper? Hmm. I would submit to you that none of us, you're not, you're not responsible for feeding your brother or making sure he has a job or even making sure he gives an adequate offering or even if he tithes. But we are responsible for how we respond when our brother is suffering. And if he's suffering because he hasn't been fed, then feeding is part of being my brother's keeper too. Feeding him. We're responsible for how we respond to our brother's suffering. In other words, we don't tell people how to run their lives. But when they're drowning, we are the hands. We are the hands. We are our brother's keeper when he's drowning. Because that's Christ. That's Christ-like. Notice how God didn't even respond to, how ridicu to this ridiculous statement. Am I, am I my brother's keeper? 
God doesn't ask questions because he needs an answer. He asks questions because to induce self-reflection. He simply got to the point, what have you done? And then follows up by making it clear that that wasn't a question. Because he said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. See, I hope, I, I'm, I hope you're getting the connection I'm trying to make. <laughs> I'm trying to make with this, with this story here. Because people right here in our nation and the blood of their families is crying out from the ground. <clears throat> and we can be the hands. We can be the hands. The body of Christ. We can respond with a righteous answer by God's standards and say, yes, I am my brother's keeper. Yes, I will be my brother's keeper. Because if we don't come together and honor God's holy commandment of love thy neighbor as thyself, then we're partially accountable for the ongoing suffering. The movie, I saw a movie, I remember in the 70s, there was this movie called uh, Oh God. George Burns played God and John Denver was a grocery store manager. Yeah, it wasn't any crazy good movie. It was popular at the time, I suppose. But it caught my attention when I saw the rerun on TV one day. And uh, God is in a grocery store and uh, John Denver is talking to God. And he tells him, people don't believe in you anymore. They're starting to not believe. And I started to say, I wonder, I know that's just script writers and it's not coming out of the Bible. But I wonder how they're going to write this, what he's going to say. And he said, why don't they believe in me? And he said, because they said, you allow so much suffering in this world. And why do you allow so much suffering? And then I'm really listening because I'm thinking, yeah, I want to see how he's going to answer this. And you know what? I think he gave the right answer. <laughs> he said, they don't believe in you because you allow so much suffering. And I'm listening for what God's response is going to be, God. And he said, I don't allow suffering, you do. He said, you, if you guys got together and listened to everything I told you, you could stop suffering. You choose not to. Don't blame that on me. Now, I know we could have theological discussions all day long about this, but the broad stroke answer I thought was pretty accurate because I think about how much human suffering can be ended simply by, listen, I, tell, I always tell people all the time, if every human being simply followed the, each, the Ten Commandments, earth would be paradise. I know we'd have storms and all that stuff, but everybody, as soon as something happened, would stop what they're doing to be more concerned about the suffering than they would themselves. Earth would be paradise if every single person followed the Ten Commandments. All right, I'm sorry, I went off on a little jag there. But Jesus cited, love thy neighbor, as the second most important commandment in Mark. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second of the greatest is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So this sermon isn't a guilt trip because we have a generous church, a generous congregation. I don't need to plead with you and try to make you feel guilty or anything. Rather, I want to talk about this today because I want to encourage everyone here with the power we have when we walk with God. We have a mighty power to help. When we come together, we can accomplish pretty much anything. And Jesus said, uh, John 14, 12, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. So when we, the body of Christ, become the hands, our brother's keeper, we see this truth manifest before our very eyes. And, and doing these things is also a way to fight evil. Do, do, having a kind heart, a compassionate heart, and helping others fights evil. That's, that's one reason Christians feel the need to do something. That's why these converses, I know Dave and I aren't the only people in, in this church that are sitting around talking about, I just feel like I need to do something, man. I want to do something. Well, that's, that's also waging war on the enemy, the spiritual enemy. We're, we're, there's because what he gave he gave a warning if if to uh, to Cain didn't he remember what God said to Cain if you don't do what is right sin is crouching at your door it desires to have you but you must rule over it and I know not everyone can give monetarily 
I get that. Uh, not everyone makes the same. Not everyone can give the same. Not, and I don't believe people should give till it hurts. We talked about the parable about the lady with the two pennies. That's another story. I'm not going to get into that right now. You should give till it feels good. Uh, because if you start to give till it hurts, the Lord doesn't want, it, it, he wants a cheerful giver, not someone who begrudgingly gives. And you, you should pray, and that's between you and God. But pray, indeed. The one thing that you have to offer that's gold is your prayers, your heart, your soul. Give that to God in your conversations. Really think about these people. I mean, pastors say, but, you know, pastor, I, I, I understand we need help. Why did God let this happen in the first place? You know, why do we have to clean this up? Why, why, could, why would he let this happen? Okay, listen to me. Before I answer that, because I get those kind of questions a lot, I want to make a statement that summarizes the, mess, the rest of this message. God, if you, don't, if you remember anything I say today, remember this. God is not the author of your suffering. He is not the author of your pain. He is the offerer of rescue. He is not the author of... Of our suffering he offers our rescue a dear friend of mine used to told me that when her daughters were little and they'd see something on the news people a tragedy uh, I think it, the example she gave was an earthquake she said she told her her little daughters he said well look for God's helpers in there you'll see them and it was always like you know paramedics or policemen or someone pulling someone out of the water in a helicopter and her little girls would go, there's one, there's one, there's one. They were looking for God's people in there, God's helpers everywhere in the tragedies. And she told them they're always there. He sends them every time. And I thought, wow, what a great way to teach a young person to look for the hands of God instead of trying to assign blame. There's one, there's another one. God often receives blame when he should receive gratitude, don't you think? I do. The hand of God is not what wiped out homes and children. The hand of God is what drove the ambulances, the helicopters, the food trucks into the disaster zone. I know there's different theological views on this, but I'm not going to get into all that. The hand of God did not sit idle by while a hurricane made handfall. The hand of God delivered lumber generators and boats to prepare for a major weather event. And on a personal level, that goes beyond today's message. The hand of God did not move away from you if you're having a problem in life. The hand of God cradles the soul of the suffering. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The peace and harmony that was destroyed by a destructive weather event in a fallen world will be restored by the hand of God, along with more people who fell to their knees and came to God because of it. So as he commands us to be his hands, to love the hurting. And this wasn't a long message. I'm at the end now. I love you. I love our church. Everyone here is so kind, so friendly, so generous. We, our church is not like any other church that I've experienced and I can't emphasize enough how today isn't a guilt to ask for giving today is to remind ourselves of the power we have when we come together in Christ's name to be our brother's keeper I thank you in advance I've already had people s send stuff in for what we're going to do so when we see people like this and little kids and lost animals and bodies in trees and there's stories that were so disturbing that I just couldn't bring them up here today to talk about. Most of you know what they are about this loss. And our response is the same. There's two words, two words from God, the same two words that are the first two words from every small church in every small town from the East Coast to the West Coast is all rise. That's the message from God when we see this suffering. All rise. And we can and we will. Amen. All right.